Network television, as you all know, its model is based on selling ads. So the content of all those programs on network, basically, you didn't really matter. You were a viewer. Were you able to stick around and watch the commercial? And, and, and I know that's a crass way of talking about it, but it is actually the economic reality of network television. You are a consumer, and we are here to sell you a product. Uh, the television show is the filler between the commercials. <laughs> and that is pretty much how that existed. Now, that didn't mean that there weren't artists working in the form and artists that were trying to explore and do interesting storytelling. A lot of great storytellings made it through that gauntlet regardless of the uh, constraints that were placed upon the artist. Once HBO came into the fold and a lot of these other television shows, they were able to think outside the box mm -hmm. and uh, because telev try Because television was actually getting more interesting in the early 90s, wasn't it? Uh, I don't know. You don't think so? I mean... <laughs> I don't know if it was that much more interesting. Um, it looked, it was a little cooler, maybe. Oh, it just shows, like, I guess, Northern Exposure that just comes to mind. Sure. They well, were. well and in, certainly in comedy, it was getting more interesting at that moment. Well, you have... You have um, you have the rise of other media that were competing for people's attention. Mm. And so you're all entertained to death. You have 500,000 options at any moment of mm. how you want to entertain yourselves. Mm. And this causes a problem for you know, a, an mm. industry that was basically had three people that were in control of everything. Mm. The explosion of cable, the same way that happened really in music, right? When you had kind of big music labels and then in, kind of in the mm. 80s, you had an explosion of independent music mm. labels. Same thing has happened in television, where so you had all take, of these channels, one sec, had all of these channels that were um, uh, exploding and were able to experiment. They were like, how can we be different than the other three people? Because they couldn't compete with size and scope at that point. Mm. And so um, I would say that when HBO put The Sopranos on the air, that was probably the kind of watershed moment of when what lightning struck and people thought, oh my God, this can work. You mean we can actually put quality television on the air and people will watch it. And that started a pretty much a pretty big revolution that we are in the middle of right now, which I really think of as the golden age of television. David, what was happening at that moment with The Sopranos? You, you know, there was an explosion in uh, the number of cable channels, I guess, right. through, the, uh, through the 90s. Sure. Uh, people were tired of running, putting reruns on the air. Sure. Uh, and they needed to... Um, to do something sensational. Was Sopranos the first, or were there other shows emerging at the same time? That one just actually rose above the That was the, the first one that really uh, caught the attention in such a big way that, it, th that there was the possibility that cable television could compete with the big three. Mm. Um, and, you know, they, they took a very interesting experimental approach at HBO. What if we, get, what if we hired really brilliant writers and we let them do what they want to do? <laughs> and that was somehow a very radical idea at the time. And uh, they had great success. And it's interesting to define success in terms of cable, premium cable television versus success in kind of commercial mm. free television. Again, in commercial free television, it's about selling ads. They couldn't, the, on cable, it's about creating buzz. I mean, that's a lot of what HBO built its, its um, kind of empire on is really quality programming. We would rather win awards than have eyeballs. Mm. Because if they can capture the public's attention, they can attract subscribers. It's subscriber-based television. So um, their ultimate goal is to get more people to subscribe. And the only way to do that is to create event television. Um, a show like Game of Thrones, which I've actually directed as well. It's, they created such a buzz around that show that you felt kind of left out if you didn't watch it, um, or people would talk about it. So they understood the water cooler mentality as a way of building um, a brand. Uh, and then they also realized at the same time that letting great writers and great artists do their work um, gives them the buzz. So how did that differ? Interesting thing, how did actually. that differ what the networks are doing? They created event television. They did. Or were they just in a sense branding the network? What, what, I think what, what networks do really well mm. is they do um, sporting events really well. They mm. do reality television really mm. well. They do news programming and they do big events like the Olympics or um, you know, an award show, the Oscars mm. or whatever. They do that really well. They mm. have access into everybody's home mm. uh, and they're able to get a lot of eyeballs doing that. 
But the, the, I'll give you an example. Like in network television, if you were a writer and you went in and pitched a show um, to make, there were rules. Like we don't want any shows that take place in the South. <laughs> there really were like weird rules. One of the rules was you can never bring us a show about um, the advertising industry. And then of course, Mad Men <laughs> happened on AMC. So you ha they have these rules, and every year they still have these rules. All the agents will get together and they'll say, okay, here's what ABC's looking for. They want a family-based comedy. Mm. And then all the writers in the world kind of go home and they figure out, how can I, I gotta come up with an idea for a family-based comedy. So it's kind of a little bit of ass backwards, right? You know, it's like they're dictating what they need and then writers are trying to put, you know, the round peg in the square hole. HBO says, hmm, that uh, Terrence Winters is a pretty brilliant writer. Let's have him come in and tell us what he has always dreamed that he wanted to do that no one ever allowed him to do. Mm. So That's where they start. And so obviously when you start from that place, mm. you're going to have some amazingly idiosyncratic mm. programming. It's not going to be programming that will necessarily appeal to 25 million viewers each week, which is what the networks need. But if it on cable, because it's subscription-based, you have these niche audiences. So you, ha you have the ability to speak to a smaller and smaller audience, which gets us to the point of where everything is going, which is you are going to become your own network president. You now get to decide what your broadcast will be each night, each day. It's you, so you are now your own network. And so the whole, the whole industry is changing to figure out what that means. David, we were discussing earlier the question of censorship. I mean, uh, you're talking about the Standards and Practices Act. I think it's uh, one of your ideas that the, the revolution in yeah. premium cable TV occurred because, not just because the brilliant artists like David Chase moved into that area, right. but it was also because they were operating in a much freer environment. You were saying that, true. You know, that broadcast environment is where they can't offend anybody. Yeah. Sometimes it seems as though these cable shows seem to set out specifically to offend. It's going well, the other yeah, way. sometimes I jokingly say HBO where high art meets porn. Because <laughs> sometimes it feels that way. But we're, you know, you guys are used to it. I think in the rest of the world, the idea of, you know, seeing naked breasts on television mm. is no big deal. In America, it was like you couldn't go near that. Um, and so on network, the standards and practices, every script goes through a process where they, you get notes back. Mm. Uh, if you are to show them making love, please be sure that no behind is shown in the shot. Literally, notes come back mm. listing everything that you are able yeah. to show and how you must film it, how you can't film it. Cable television was like, was like the Wild West. You could do anything you wanted. Mm. Um, and that's still true. So because of that, the storytelling was able to evolve, mm. right? Which is extraordinary to me because standards and practices is not a, a government body, is it? It's it's it's, it's lawyers, I guess, in, inside of individual pretty much uh, broadcasters. Yeah, yeah. It gets into decency laws, so it is actually yeah. ultimately to protect, as everything in America is, it's to protect you from being sued. <laughs> and and yet um, the cable channels, because I guess people pay the you know, pay they're for paid, therefore they're like private channels. They're private channels, so which is extraordinary that so they're above the law. And yet they're only one turn on the on the dial across from the other, and children are watching it. But yeah. no one seems to no. to make it make. It's, but it's, I mean, for 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 writers and for filmmakers, the mm -hmm. idea that you could tell your story in a different way, I mean, and you didn't have to fit in this particular box, really freed up the artistic imagination. Yeah. And and I, another thing is like you see on premium cable shows about what we call franchises, okay, which is, um, you know, like a medical show, it's a medical franchise or fireman is a fireman. It's set in a place and it's about these particular people. And networks have very strict franchises. They repeat over and over and over and over again, right? You see, there's got to be a medical show on. There's got to be a show about lawyers. And they tend to be things where there are life and death stakes because all of the, the structure of network television is to get you to the commercial, okay? So it has a six-act structure where at the end of each act, there's this incredible event, some sort of high-stakes event. There's a man out on a ledge. He's about to jump. And then you go to a commercial and you stay because you want to know what happened to the guy on the ledge. And then you come back and he's like sitting having tea and he just changed his mind. He's not jumping off the ledge. <laughs> and this happens six times in the hour. And this is how they get you to stay to watch the commercial. In commercial-free cable, 
writers were freed up from the, those kind of inflated stakes to create mm. kind of events that they had to you know, force you to come back. They could take a, a slower form of storytelling. They could tell a story over eight hours. In fact, one of the most common notes you know, from HBO to writers early on and still is, could you tell the story a little slower? <laughs> And if you watch Boardwalk Empire, mm -hmm. you know that they tell the story extremely slowly, um, so but in a good, you know, a great way. But. So the idea of um, not wrapping a storyline up at the end of, a, of an hour, that yeah. was quite radical when The Sopranos came along. I mean, were things like that happening? We had the miniseries, I guess. Yeah, well, like the mini, the mini, the that's interesting, because the miniseries is, is really the precursor to cable television when you think about it. Mm. Networks would, you know, like Roots, you go back to shows like that, or Jewel in the Crown, is that? Yes. Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. They were limited series. They were however many hours they were, and they were these bigger productions than your normal show. The problem was they didn't quite have the resources to do them. Kind of, they didn't look great. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't look, they weren't competing with movies. And so you also have to look at the rise of technology and what we're able to do now. When you look at a show like Game of Thrones, for example, the quality of that show and the amount of visual effects in each episode could never have been done 10 years ago. Now there's some kid in the back room in a computer who can you know, sit there and say, hey, let's, let, let's see what it looks like if these dragons you know, move from here to there. Mm -hmm. And before that would have cost you millions of dollars. So the quality of television has moved into the same realm as cinema. And as a result, uh, it's competing with cinema. And, and I'd like to get into that idea that we talked about that, mm. you know, it is, I think cable television is replacing film. And it's doing that because there's a huge zone of storytelling mm. that movies no longer are able to afford to do. They can do the $200 million tentpole blockbuster movie. And the reason that, the reason that is, is changing is that it, I'm, and again, I'm talking about American Hollywood movies. Obviously, there are movies in every country that are amazing movies that somehow manage to get made, often with government help, which we don't have. Um, so without that, and it's really about the bottom line, um, these movies have to be uh, exported to 50 countries. And so when you're trying to create a work of art that has to speak to 50 cultures, there's an inevitable watering down of the storytelling process. You're gonna have a guy with a white hat and a guy with a black hat, and the guy with the white hat's the good guy, and the guy in the black hat's the bad guy. And all the subtleties and nuance of storytelling is removed from them. So what happens? And also, they also have to feed, I was at Disney and I had a, a, a meeting at Disney with an executive and I said, hey, I know you make these massive, huge movies. What if you, you know, just give me a hundred million dollars and I'll make you 10, 10 million dollar movies and I guarantee you like three or four of them will be great <laughs> and they'll make your money back. Mm -hmm. The rest might not, but why don't you do that? And with a straight face, they looked at me and said, we can't do that because we have to feed the machine. Mm -hmm. And I said, what are you talking about? They said, we have theme parks. We have a global reach. We have to be able to build a ride out of that movie, <laughs> you know? And that's really the truth. They are multinational. So all the middle ground of storytelling, filmmakers, writers, actors, have gravitated to premium cable where they get to play a character that has nuance and develops and, and they get to write stories that take place over a long period of time and, and have twists and turns and has quality and are pauses where things happen in silence. These are um, things that we don't see in the big Hollywood movie anymore. We go, we, big Hollywood movies are like, you know, ride the rides. You're going to ride the movie. And when it's great, they're amazing, and they're, they transcend their limitations. So, David, cable TV just coincided with the collapse of what people are calling the middle ground in Hollywood movie totally. making, adult filmmaking. Absolutely. So, cinema globalised in the 90s. Uh, the middle ground collapsed. There was dozens and dozens of talented filmmakers with nothing to do. If they didn't want to make, you know, grungy, low-budget films, yeah. they actually wanted to work in that kind of middle ground, which was kind of the space of the 70s. And now people are talking about 
cable TV is really repl- is a kind of golden age, but also matches the golden age of cinema of the, in the United States of the 1970s. I think so. And hence all that That's talent. the period I loved. That That's period the period of the Godfather. And so you're getting people like, like Martin Scorsese producing Boardwalk Empire. Directing. Directing the Zandt, pilot. Directing. So there's talent all over the place. Yeah, well, the problem is those, these, we have these, the, these great filmmakers who don't get to make films anymore. Mm. Um, they just don't get to make their movies. You're I mean, it took, it took Steven Spielberg, what, eight, nine years to get Lincoln made. And he's Steven Spielberg. Yeah. So it's like, you know, God forbid you're, you know, me trying to get a movie made. <laughs> you know, and, it takes that long. And you were telling me now that as a, as a veteran TV director, you're now competing against... Yeah, I'm competing against Martin Scorsese. Oscar-nominated Oscar <laughs> uh, filmmakers. Exactly, yeah. because they're all rushing into television yeah. because there's no work for them. Yeah. Um, the, and studios used to release and make a ton more movies a year yeah. than they did. And they would make like the big movie and then they'd go, let's make you know, five movies for 20 million. And th- mm-hmm. those would be the ones, we'll take a risk with that. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's take a risk and this guy's a really good filmmaker, let's give him money to do a movie and maybe it'll get nominated for awards. Mm-hmm. Now they pick one script a year, maybe two, that they're like, these will be our really arty movies that we hope will win awards. And that's it. Mm. And the only people getting those are very, very big people. On the so other TV has really filled in the... Um, in uh, the um, and it. the positive side is that the talent coming, the acting talent and the writing talent. Sure. You must now, as a director, be staggered at the kind of actors yeah, that amazing. are stepping into your, into your little TV show. Everybody wants to do premium cable. Mm. It's kind of an amazing... That's what I think... So the economics are also... Um, creating the golden age. I mean, you can't, it, it's not just an artist driven, it, it's, t- television was always a commercial industry. So you can't separate the economics from what's happening. Now, you know, how long will it last? As long as it makes money. When it stops making money, it won't last. <laughs> And that is unfortunately the reality. Um, I don't. I think though that in the landscape of television, mm. it may have profoundly changed for a very long time. Uh, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. It's like you know, television's in your house. It's a member of your family. A movie theater is not. Um, and with what's going on, you know, with Apple TV and what they're developing and where things are going, they're tr- they're they are working to make that television or those televisions in your house to become even more a part of your family. They're going to do amazing things for you. And so um, this idea of what is cinema and what is television is kind of a line that doesn't really matter anymore. One, you go to a building to watch, the other you watch in your house. So it's really, and, and the screens in your home are getting bigger and bigger and the screens in the movie theater are getting smaller and smaller. And you're taking, you're taking an iPad or a tablet to bed with you, which is kind of a book, but you can also watch a television show on it or a movie. So everything is converging into, again, you being the master of your leisure time. And what you choose to watch, when you choose to watch it, um, is the future. And so you are all empowered in a certain way. Now, what that means when you have you know, it's, it was easy when you had three channels and you had three choices, right? It was easy for people to predict what to do, how to spend money on content, where to put the money to, to have programming happen. When you have unlimited choices, it's going to become very interesting to see what happens in the economic model. So people are throwing things against the wall to see what will stick. Uh, an example being Netflix releasing House of Cards. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a, a new series. Uh, Netflix, who you know provides movies, you subscribe, is now creating original programming. Mm-hmm. So they created a show called House of Cards with Kevin Spacey, very high quality. David Fincher directed, directed it. It's a 13-hour series. Uh, two Fridays ago, it was released for you to download from Netflix, the entire 13 episodes all at once. So this is a new model. Instead of making you wait week after week, they believe... Mm-hmm that um, people will want to binge view, which is how a lot of us are watching our material now, yeah. right? You either go and buy the box set, and you, watch the, you lock yourself in your apartment, and you don't leave, you don't bathe, you don't eat, and you watch like five seasons, and you emerge in the daylight like a vampire, and you're shocked that like the entire weekend has gone by. You've probably gone through a couple bottles of wine. Um, so that's a new way of viewing. and and how to um, 
how the economics of that will play out are going to determine very much how long the quality of that programming will exist for you to see. And, and the aesthetics. I mean, at what Absolutely. level? Why have a 13-hour television series? Why not have a 13-hour movie? What's, why have the, the titles come up at the end and start again? When people just fast-forward through exactly. them. Why not just keep the whole thing going? So why, as you say, the lines between them are, are blurring? I want to take that idea up a little bit further. As a director, you know, you began working on The Gilmore Girls and uh, Dawson's Creek... Um, all those uh, great shows in the 90s. As a WB and, boy. And then moving through. As a director, um, has the, is your approach to direction changed? Very I mean, much Are you so. given more resources? Are you working more like a, film, a yeah. filmmaker rather than a television director? Absolutely. I'll give you a good example. Um, so doing a typical episode for the WB way back when, you were given seven days to shoot the entire episode and um, very limited resources, sets, you were either on a studio on a back lot, you rarely left the lot, everything was created there, um, and that was it. Game of Thrones, I directed two episodes in season two. I was employed for five months. I had a prep time of about 22 days per episode to pre to work with, uh, to scout locations. I shot about 24 or 25 days per episode mm -hmm. and edited for four or five weeks. Mm -hmm. So that is on par, if not surpassing, mm -hmm. major feature films mm -hmm. in terms of the time that you're allowed as an artist to do your job. The resources available to me were staggering and um, we shot, the, the production's based in uh, Belfast in Northern Ireland, but we also shoot part of it in Croatia and part of it in Iceland. Uh, this past year, they also added Morocco to the list. So this is a global television show being produced on a scale that um, very few movies are yeah. produced on now. So again, the, the blurring of the line, it's gone. The line has been passed. What about uh, how you actually shoot in terms yeah. of, you know, framing, for instance? Are you thinking, you know, TVs, and I have a 55-inch right. television. I notice they only cost $800 now at uh, right. Debbie High Five. That's a good point. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Are you point. thinking, I'm going to be almost shooting yeah. for the wide screen that's funny. now instead it, of having that little box there? Totally. Well, when, you know, TVs used to be what we call 4 by 3 format, right? They weren't panoramic 16 by 9 frame. They were 4 by 3 you guys might have always had 16 by 9. We in America on network had to direct a frame that was a square, not a frame that was a rectangle. And so it was conducive to this, to a close-up. So you would direct Dawson's Creek and you'd do a close-up. Then you'd do another close-up. Then you do another close-up. Then you go like, oh, let's do a wide shot. Yeah, but they'll never use it. Let's do it anyway. You'd shoot it and they'd never use it. And so that was how that worked. On cable... It's like, it's all about the cinematic experience. I mean, on Game of Thrones or even Boardwalk Empire that I've done or True Blood, all of those, you're using wide angle lenses. You are shooting, we're in Croatia, we're in Iceland on glaciers. It's like, <laughs> how wide can you shoot? Mm. And also they let it play in the wide. You know, a lot of times, I don't know if you're familiar with the process of television directing, but what happens is, I always say that, that theater is an actor's medium um, television is a writer's medium and film is a director's medium. Now as that line between TV and film blurs, TV is becoming kind of a more balanced writer-director medium, but the writer ultimately yeah. is king. So I shoot my episode, I edit my episode, it then goes to the writer-creator who can do whatever he wants with that material yeah. and often they will re-edit it. On premium cable, I would say 95% of the time, what I turn in is what you see. Mm. On network television, 30% of the time of what a director turns in is what you see. How much freedom do you have? Because you know, you've got 13 episodes of, say, House of Cards. It's got seven or eight different directors, some very high-profile directors, I notice, and they're guys who have directed feature films. Uh, a, a style is set up, I guess, or some kind of template is set up. We yeah. want it to look a bit like this. They yeah. use the same cinematographer all the way through, I would imagine. Exactly. Same actors. Sometimes alternate uh, DPs, they'll have two because it's so grueling. 
they'll yeah. have two directors of photographer who are on the same page and they'll alternate episodes. Okay. Are you given much freedom? I mean, I know that there are certain episodes, The Sopranos, that were often talked about. Yeah. Like that one is one of the groundbreaking episodes. Yeah, like the Pine Barrens. Yeah, yeah, probably connected more to the writer than the director. Or within the industry, are you familiar with certain styles? I mean, uh, Absolutely. The, the series that's caught my attention most at a visual level is Breaking Bad. And I'm actually speak, thinking of one particular episode where they, they rob a train and end up shooting a kid at the end of it. Sorry for giving it away for those who haven't binged yet. Um, and it, it's largely silent, that whole sequence. It's a, just a pure piece of cinema. Right. Uh, is that something you feel that the directors are imposing themselves on, or are the writers still dominating television? I still think it, it comes from the writer, um, initially. That, I'm sure like an episode like that where the writers were in the writer's room and they said, you know, let's do this. This would be so cool. And no one's going to stop us because it's cable television. So, yeah. you know, the shackles are being taken off of the writers too. Yeah. And they're able to dream and create without the limitations placed on them. That then informs the rest of everybody else. So we are able to dream. I mean, there are sequences. Mm. I mean, when I, I get to be a director in premium cable mm. on network, I am a facilitator. And that's a very big difference. So I'm able to take a script on, on premium cable, read it. I have a conversation with the writer. I say, you know, I can do this with this shot. I think you could lose this, get rid of this. Maybe mm. this can go away. And they're like, okay, great. Or they're like, no, 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 we need that because eight episodes from now. Like they are the keeper of the flame. Mm. Often I will, I'm coming in. I don't know what they're thinking two seasons down. And they go, no, we need you to set this up. But I'm adding a huge visual component to what they're doing and storytelling. I'm helping them tell their story in a visual way that often helps them rewrite, re-see, uh, reimagine things. So it is very, very collaborative. I feel like a filmmaker doing uh, the HBO work. And yet there still would be a frustration, hence is why you were telling me you're developing your own series for a, a number company of called um, Amazon.com. Yeah. And uh, what is Amazon doing uh, making movies when they normally sell, send, send books uh, out? Amazon them? is a behemoth. Mm. They will be everywhere in your life. They already are. Um, they have a streaming, they have a video streaming. I don't know if you have it here, do you? When you're uh, Amazon, well, in America, you'll probably get it here. Amazon Prime, it's called. You pay $75 a year. You become a Prime member. And what you get for that Prime membership is. Um, free overnight shipping for anything you order on Amazon, which is a pretty good deal. And then they have their own content. You can stream live video. They have a whole library of movies, television shows, mm -hmm. and that comes for free with your $75 a year. Now, mm -hmm. uh, coming up this year, they are launching two premium cable channels as well as a full online streaming service. You know, the whole mm. cutting the cord is kind of the terminology that's been used lately, which is you're no longer gonna need a cable company, right? You just need an internet and you'll be streaming from the internet everything you need to see. So why are you paying $150 a month or whatever you pay for this ridiculous cable company that's providing you 300 channels that you don't watch, right? You maybe watch three or four of them or you I mean, how much do you really use your cable? So uh, this is the future too. You can do it now. You can jettison your cable company and start and you get Apple TV or a Roku or mm. a box that can stream and puts a computer on your television. You pick and choose and pay as you go the way you do with iTunes. So um, Amazon, like Netflix, are kind of leading the way toward we don't need networks anymore. We don't need channels anymore. We, you just need content. And so Amazon is launching two channels. Um, they've already um, made, I think, uh, 10 half-hour single-camera comedies that uh, are coming out very soon. So, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about... And you're developing a show yourself? I sold a show to them, yeah, that I'm creating with Mark McKinney from Kids in the Hall. I don't know if you guys know Kids in the Hall, but um, it's... Uh, yeah, it's very exciting. Is that, again, your desire to as much I'm as I'm going to become a working... content provider. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but is that also your desire? I mean, as much as uh, cable is a revolution, yeah. it's, still, it's still, as you say, a writer's medium. And until you become a show creator, that's when you feel as though you can actually you know, flex your muscles. As, yeah, as a I think you, you can flex your muscles as a filmmaker, but it's different when it's mm. your show. Yes, right. indeed. And movies. I mean, I don't want to forget movies because you are going ahead and uh, shooting a, a movie them, very, yeah. very soon. Yeah. Uh, you're very closely associated. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm doing a movie based on a play that David Lindsay Abair wrote who won the Pulitzer Prize a couple mm -hmm. years ago. And um, I've been making this movie for nine years. 
process. Which is a really interesting point you make, isn't it? Because that's one of those middle ground films that it requires you've got movie stars. You said to me you've got Annette Benning attached to the film yeah. and you still are struggling to raise Yeah, it's amazing how you get... Yeah, it's amazing now. This is why television is kind of... Again, gets back mm -hmm. to why television is, is becoming a more preferred medium. In order to get a movie made, it's next to impossible outside of the studio system in America. I mean, to make an indie film... It's like you can make a movie, if you want to make a movie for under a million dollars, that's fine. Mm. If you want to make a movie for $50 million and it all the pieces come together, that's fine. But if you want to make anything in between, mm. it's next to impossible. And the whole way you go about doing that is that you have to attach talent, meaning you have to get actors attached. But you can't just get good actors attached. You have to get actors that pre-sell foreign territories overseas. So that limits who you can put in your movie and who's right for it. Mm -hmm. um, basically, you attach an actor, they bring it to the marketplace. France says, we love that actor. We'll, we'll pre-buy and give you $500,000 because so-and-so's in your movie. Mm -hmm. So again, movies are becoming created in a bit of an ass-backwards way again, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're not getting the best actor. You're getting the actor who gets your movie made, mm -hmm. um, which if all these choices, all these compromises that continually kind of pull the passion, the joy mm. <laughs> slowly away mm. from what you're doing. And it takes years and people commit and they drop out. So it's a very difficult environment, at least in America right now, to make an independent movie. We don't have government support. There's zero. We don't get government support for anything anymore. They'd like to get rid of our government totally. Um, mm. They're doing a pretty good job of it. But... Um, David, yeah. we're in the middle of a writer's festival here, and I guess, you know, this oh, right. rise... Sorry about that. People are here, they can read, uh, not just scripts. Excellent. Um, the, um, I guess, you know, with the rise of premium cable, the DVD box set revolution, uh, people are talking about uh, premium cable replacing or challenging cinema. It's uh, not totally. just replaced, but it's also, um, I think, literature would be, in, in a sense, you know, the evening... The, you don't sit down in the, the no, at the evening and read a novel. Now you sit down and take out the box set. It also throwing up a challenge. You take out your tablet. You take bed. out your tablet, in fact. And also challenging theatre as well, you know. So Absolutely. Exactly, it's kind of the um, innovative new art form. But not that innovative, is it? I mean, you, you were, we were discussing it probably as a throwback to, say, the Dickensian novel of the 19th century. Well, a little bit, yeah. I think that's some of the things we're getting into some of these other panels. But, um, yeah, I think very much so, the serialised novel... Is, is it shares art? certain comparisons? Do you believe, with as I've asserted, cable? is it is an art form in its own right? Oh now? my God, absolutely! I think it, it absolutely it became an art form when it became when it transformed from filler between commercials. Mm. And which are the uh, not that art wasn't there weren't artistic endeavors in television before that that made it through the cracks and slipped through. I mean, you can look back at like you know the period with Norman Norman Lear creating All in the Family and shows like that, which were groundbreaking, really mm. seriously. I mean, issue based half hour comedy dealing with social issues. I mm. mean, with commercials, I think you'd never get that show on the air now. Which are the peaks of the art form since, if we say The Sopranos was the beginning of the revolution? Yeah. You know, we know The Wire back then. For you, which are the three or four shows that you really believe that have sort of, you know, gone beyond The Sopranos and taken it to another level? I don't know if I'd say they've gone beyond it, but are in the same... League? Yeah, same league. I would say shows like, whether you like them or not, Boardwalk Empire is in that zone. I'd yeah. say Game of Thrones for the fact mm. that it's the first time a major fantasy series with kind of Shakespearean structural undertones mm. kind of, and the quality of it puts mm. as a game changer. I mean, if you go to a lot of the premium cable channels now, they're like, do you have anything that's like Game of Thrones? <laughs> we would like one of those. <laughs> uh, and you also find it's interesting what the cable revolution has done, just to, to go off for a second, has done to network television because they are now experimenting because they are experimenting for their very survival. Mm. They are, you know, there was a moment that happened a few years ago where cable ratings started to overtake mm. free television. And so they're freaked out. They're totally freaked out. And, and NBC, probably more than any of them, is like, let's experiment. What can we do? And so they're trying to do things. So they do things like the Playboy Club, which... <laughs> Did not work. <laughs> but um, it's interesting to watch them try yeah. to, to emulate cable, yet they're still in this model that they can't get out of.
Um, and until that changes, they're in trouble. They're in serious trouble. I mean, I kind of feel like they are dinosaurs in the pit and they're just waiting to get knocked over a little bit. And David, bit. I have a theory that um, cable TV is actually starting to influence cinema. Absolutely. I mean, a few years ago, there was this big discussion that uh, we're living in the attention deficit disorder generation. They can't watch anything. What I'm seeing is people watching show after show, hour after hour. And then in the last couple of years, and particularly this year's Oscars, all the films that are coming out are upwards of three hours long and people, right. are, and they've all been hits. And Zero Dark Thirty looks very similar to Homeland to me. They're almost interchangeable shows. Are you feeling it's becoming that powerful an influence? It's actually spreading away and back into Yeah, the again, I think there's no boundaries anymore. I don't think there, this, this is a false division to say mm -hmm. television or cinema anymore. I mean, it's like, it, and even really novels, although I know it's got a very different mm. um, experience. Yeah. And you can do things in a novel that you just could never do, uh, you know, in moving pictures. Mm. You just can't do it. You can't, t you know, like I was saying the other day, you know, on Moby Dick, you can have a whole chapter about harpoon, harpoon mm. points, right? <laughs> you couldn't really do that on television. Mm -hmm. I think people would turn the channel. Mm -hmm. But, you know, maybe. <laughs> And even the best of premium cable can get a little pulpy at times. I mean, uh, it, it thrives on that. You know, I it mean, really it's, it wants is, people to keep watching. It's a penny dreadful. It's I a, mean, it is, is trying to keep you engaged. Mm. Um, absolutely. I mean, that is. I mean, it, I find it. I find its similarity with with writing closest to Dickens. Really. Yeah. You know the way that that was written, and also multi-characters and that kind of stuff. So anyway. Okay, I think we've talked a lot, far too much, we've David. So we're going to ask them, uh, open it up to the audience there. So we have a first question there. I've actually got two questions. Uh, you alluded to watching TV, not having cable TV anymore, just using your Apple TV and podcasts and so on. That's what I do right now, and I love it. Is it going to be possible in that economic model to keep making quality shows such as now? That is a very, very big question. Can um, I ask my second question first as well? <laughs> Oh, God, it's gone. <laughs> oh, no, that's it. it why, why is it only HBO? Because every time I see a brilliant show, it's like HBO I wouldn't up. say that's true. That may be... That, 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 that speaks to the incredible success of HBO's marketing worldwide. Um, there are other... I would say the, when we discuss kind of premium cable in the States, we talk about HBO, Showtime, uh, Stars, uh, a and uh, AMC, AMC and um, even Bravo now a little bit are getting into. Listen, the Discovery Channel, I was just mm -hmm. up to do a job for the Discovery. They called me. They are getting into scripted drama. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, every cable channel wants to, they, they must, there must be gold in them, our hills, because they're all, like they're doing a, a, like a eight, part series set in 1895. This is the other thing on network. My God, if you ever went in and pitched a period drama, they would throw you out of the office. <laughs> I mean, literally, they'd be like, no, thank you. And now it's like these cable shows are, are exploring all these interesting periods. So there are other and, and more coming. Uh, again, it's not channels, it's content providers. And we have to get out of this mentality of like, HBO is a brand. Uh, and they've been so successful at their, they control their product. It's very hard to get their programming. Um, they keep it that way. They have an exclusivity about them that they like to use, which gets them to a higher, uh, a more moneyed viewer in some weird way. So anyway, that's... Yeah. A little bit. Oh, if, uh, if the money that, does, if yeah. the money's in there, it won't happen. I think the greatest for me, Mad Men, comes from AMC, exactly. so it's not that restricted. Yes. Hi. Um, hey. You were talking about directors now, like Scorsese, coming into the market. Is that happening with writers as well? And what does that mean for emerging writers? Is there less opportunities, or is there actually more opportunities because they're looking for more original? I think the answer there? to that is both. I mean. Um, Yes, extremely experienced writers are are sought after. I mean, if you and also uh, novelists, you know, HBO is all about looking at you know big novelists coming into the into the television yeah. mode. And frankly, novelists who used to like get their movies, get their books turned into movies, and have had quite unsatisfactory results with that, and have two hours to have their novel adapted, go, mm, you know what, my novel's a little more interesting than that. I could go to somewhere at HBO and it would be 10 hours or it could be three seasons. 
So that's more appealing because you can get, you know, so it is attracting big talent. And, and in terms of younger writers, there's so much going on um, that I actually think there's more opportunities. You have to remember that these shows often, even though there's a big writer, there's a writer's room. So there's four or five writers hired to work with that writer in, in a lot of cases. So there's tons of opportunities for writing. Um, there's, there's, you either do it through working your way up through it or you become a very big writer and then you go the other way. It depends. They, there's been some interesting experiments with that. HBO um, was doing a very high profile pilot uh, based on the corrections. Uh, which they then didn't make. So it's an interesting, you know, they're not above that. They'll hire very big talent, and if they don't like it, they'll be like, sorry, we're not making it. Yeah. So, you know, I think it works both ways, and that's up to the, you know, the novelist and up to the, the network, and there's a conversation about that and whether they're qualified or whether they work aside with somebody. But a lot of times they buy the material and they don't want to do it. You know, a lot of novelists don't have any interest in that. And, they, and a lot of novelists are humble enough to also understand that it is a different medium and it requires something quite different. Um, it's not the same thing. It's sometimes too painful. <laughs> yes, I noticed Eric Roth was one of the producers on House of Cards. Oscar-winning screenwriter on mm -hmm. Forrest Gump, so the talent uh, drawn oh, yeah. again is, is extraordinary. Absolutely. Yes. Yep. Um, back to the economic model in Australia. Um, on the 1st of April, our next season of Game of Thrones starts on the 31st of March. There'll be a spike on the internet where we don't bother waiting for Australian TV and Australian pricing. We just download it online through various mechanisms. Um, <laughs> you mean or, illegally? <laughs> um, Australia has privacy law. Try and find me. Um, which means, that, however, 11 months later, just before season four, when HBO finally released the box set, um, there's, a good, there's a good chance I'll end up buying it, even though I want like Australian pricing still. How does that... When people... And lot, I'm sure a lot of people in this room are doing the same thing. When, because... Well, I can't believe so many people know Game of Thrones when it hasn't actually been broadcast yet. <laughs> oh, yes, it has. Um, you mentioned HBO... Oh, it has? You okay, mentioned HBO's okay. marketing. Whew. And George Martin is better than talking. Um, but with that, I'm sure it happens all over the world, um, where people download for free sure. and then possibly buy the box set later. Does the economics of that work as well as pay TV? As That's, TV? That is a policing issue. And frankly, technology will take care of that. Yeah. And there is some value to um, allowing certain things to be able to be downloaded. They won't tell you that, yeah. but I mean, if you're creating buzz, mm. there's a certain amount of that that is kind of a wink and a nod. I mean, it's illegal and you shouldn't do it. Going on record as saying that. I think, David, part of, part of the logic of House of Cards coming out all at once was in an attempt to stop illegal downloading. So the quicker you can get it out as a kind of a, a cultural phenomenon in right. one day, a bit like a, a blockbuster movie to some extent. So right. the industry itself is struggling a little bit. They're trying to, they're looking for ways of... Right, well, that's also phenomenon. why you see even on movies are released and then the uh, online release date, the window, is shortening up so that a movie might be available pay-per-view on your yeah. television like a week later, or sometimes two days later. So. Yes, it, it will affect it. It definitely affects it. But more importantly, it affects, you know, it actually takes money out of the mouths of people making it. That's, that's the biggest issue. But technology will fix the piracy issue. I have no doubt. David, thank you. My name's Lynn. Uh, thank you for addressing us today. My question is going to seem parochial, but I'm not going to make an Bring apology for that. Um, sadly, Australia is guilty of exporting a lot of its talent because there isn't the large film industry within Australia, and particularly Western Australia. How can we make Australia more attractive to the filmmaker director? Uh, that's a very complicated question. <laughs> uh, I would say. I was talking to someone about this the other day in the, in the car. I said, what are the big Australian television shows, yeah. right? And they were telling me, and, I, and they were like, well, this one's about, and some of them are so much about, specifically about 
being Australian, which they should be. Mm -hmm. But I think in America, we have this weird, like, lack of that. So there's a lot of TV shows that are specific to America, but they think globally, you know, like, like I said, I, and I'm not sure that's a good thing. So, you know, I say this with, you know, one, both sides of my hand going at the same time. Listen, we're losing our production. America is losing production to around the world. We have become a global economy in terms of entertainment. So, I mean, I, like I told you, I shot Game of Thrones in Ireland, Croatia, Iceland, right? Stars is making most of their new series not in America because they're going like the textile industry or any other industry where the labor is cheaper, um, where the tax rebates are best. So, you know, I think we're all in the same boat. I mean, it may seem that way to you. Um, we had a much bigger industry to lose, and right now we're all going to be working for China anyway in 10 years, making movies in China. I'm not kidding. I mean, they're starting to make studio agreements. You know, the big studios are opening up studios in China. Um, we'll probably be brought over there to teach them how to make movies, and then after 10 years they'll say, thank you very much. <laughs> and then that will be another industry we've lost. So um, I don't know the answer to that, other than to continue to demand quality and... Um, to think a little bit more globally about the storytelling as much as you can without watering down what is uniquely, uniquely you. And I don't know if that answers your question because yeah. it's a complicated one. Well, I'm just wondering what, what about the Australian environment doesn't attract filmmakers to come here? It's probably economics. It's probably the exchange rate. It's got nothing to do with anything else. I don't know. No, I'm it really doesn't. I have to tell you, like... Mm -hmm. You know, why is, why is Budapest so f popular for filmmakers? Because it's really cheap to film there. Mm. So it is, again, these things are driven by economics. They, yeah. they, go, they go where you get. As a filmmaker, you would do that, right? I'm going to go to a place where if I can get, instead of having, you know, 10 extras barely dressed, I can have 500 extras and 18 horses for the same price in my frame. Mm. I'm going to go there. So it's not just them, it's the filmmakers. So it's expenses. It's really, that's, that really drives a lot of it. Well, we have our own Game of Thrones happening now. We've got an election on, so we've got a, an emperor versus a, a, a pretender. Uh, we'll have time for one more question. Uh, uh, up the back there, on the right-hand side. In fact, uh, an HBO are doing co-productions. Uh, we have, I think, Paul Barron is producing a series at the moment, uh, an HBO co-production up in really? Indonesia. In Singapore, yes. Yeah. So, you know, that wow. HBO is making those links as well, yes. And Ewan McGregor is about to start shooting a movie next week, so we are attracting productions here in Perth. Yes. Hi, David. I'm going to be cheeky and ask two questions. Um, the first one is an economics-based question. I'm a massive fan of a show called Treme from HBO, mm -hmm. but I imagine with a huge ensemble cast that that's a show that costs them a lot of money and doesn't really make it back. Exactly. So that's a quality versus cost issue. And are we going to be able that's to an investment that? in the writer. Yeah, that's a um, a writer that they uh, has been good to them. Has they continue want to have a lifetime relationship with them, mm -hmm. and it's a show that they believe in and has a demographic that works for them. But yes, there were times when Treme had four hundred thousand viewers. Mm -hmm. It's a very expensive show that yeah. that makes no economic sense. Yeah. yeah. And Michael Mann's series failed. It was a glorious series, the yeah, it uh, racing actually, it series. Actually, yeah, luck. It luck. actually didn't fail. Mm. There were horses that died the horses in the making died. of it. Do you believe that? <laughs> that is the official line. <laughs> but again, I'm Michael, sticking to it. Yeah. So not every show, not every show is a success. No, well, it's how you famous. define success. Again, that's what I was saying. Like on HBO, success is not always defined by um, a bottom line. It's buzz, cachet, uh, brand. Mm -hmm. Um, awards, they will keep a show on. It's also perception. Um, they don't like to be perceived as having a failure. So Treme will have four or five seasons. Have we got time for one more? Well, she had yeah. another question. And, and so, um, she was being cheeky. Yes. <laughs> Leading on from that, um, can you talk then about Aaron Sorkin's move to HBO and the perception of the audience that we're really not getting anything beyond what we'd normally get on network TV, except for maybe an extra bit of swearing. Well, I would, I would say that Aaron Sorkin is a writer who would have been on premium cable if it had existed. I don't think that's a, that's a totally natural uh, fit to me. I mean, I think that there was an artist pushing the envelope in network television, 
and, and now is able to have even more control uh, uh, over what it I do. I do. I mean, I, I, yeah, I think yes and no. Yeah, I mean, we also have reality television, so <laughs> I think there's an equal, you know, rise and an equal descent at the same time in what we like. Okay, I think that's uh, just about time, isn't it? That's right. Just about wrap it up now. Uh, I, th I encourage you all to uh, get onto either YouTube or uh, whatever source you have for looking at things. And look YouTube at, or whatever, or pay or pay on How iTunes. About pay to see. for it. And what do they? What do you recommend they look of yours? You know, you big love. I love that series. That you was did three eight, years. Of, eight, I did a lot. I did episodes. more of them. Yeah, that's. The, I love that show. And what's coming up for us to look out for you? Uh, Magic Can City, you were saying? Magic City, yeah, on mm -hmm. stars. It's a really interesting series. You guys probably don't know that series. It's and 1959 Miami Beach. It's kind of like Sopranos meets Mad Men. And Smash, I think, is where we're all watching. Smash. And I understand you got, and you got a compliment from uh, a guy called Steven Spielberg. I did. <laughs> Thank you. He liked your tracking he liked, shot. He liked that shot. Yes, he did. <laughs> yes, he did. Yes, he did. Thank you, David Petrarca. I can Thank have a chat with you.